our next uh, speaker is uh, Julia Ildemeyer. Um, Julia, your floor is yours. Hi, uh, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me on this webinar today. Uh, great attendance, by the way. Um, so um, I wanted to um, to bring in a bit of a, a, a broader perspective on regulation and um, planning and uh, uh, funding the uh, the infrastructure network we would all like to see in, in Europe. Um, at the Regulatory Assistance Project, we are advising mostly in power sector regulation, but obviously also uh, in our e-mobility program. Uh, we look at things really from the grid integration um, uh, point of view. So um, how we can secure the huge benefits that, that EVs can bring to advance the transport and the energy transition. Um, I don't need to recall them here in much detail, um, but EVs can provide a, a great source of flexibility. They can help to integrate more renewables. They can thus decarbonize transport and power um, in parallel um, and reduce costs for the entire system, but also for consumers. And that's where discussing infrastructure is very good news um, because charging infrastructure is, of course, the crucial ingredient to unlock these benefits, um, because that's really where the EV meets the power grid. So it's important that we get it right. And um, the question I want to highlight in this discussion is how we can build charging infrastructure in the most beneficial way. And um, first, secure access to e-mobility for all drivers and provide sufficient coverage. And second, build a market for charging services that is self-sustaining, that meets consumers' needs and that unlocks these benefits I've just introduced. Um, and we think to develop this market, we first of all need a common European vision. Next slide, please. And that vision would be that consumer or EV drivers everywhere should have ready access to sufficient, accessible and smart charging infrastructure to fit their needs at attractive prices. By attractive, we mean affordable for the consumer. And of course, the AFI directive we're discussing today can help to put this vision into practice and develop the market um, by providing the infrastructure it needs. Um, and to achieve this vision may actually be a bit more difficult in uh, locations that may not be profitable from the very beginning. May they be in remote areas or may they be expensive for different reasons. Um, and I think this is the key, uh, one of the key regulatory questions here. It's how the EU or member states, governments can develop charging infrastructure uh, that the market may not create or support in the beginning. Um, because uh, locations may not be uh, uh, profitable um, in the first step. In other words, how can it secure sufficient coverage, but at the same time allow or encourage cost efficient operation of charging points, because we do want to avoid stranded assets and over subsidizing at the other hand. Next slide, please. So, um, this is where um, we've studied one approach um, that I want to bring into this discussion. It's being developed in several uh, states in the US, um, and we call it an essential charging network. Um, the aim is basically to build um, minimum charging infrastructure as a starting point for developing a broader EV charging market. And this essential network would include what you could call hard to serve areas from a commercial point of view, that is locations that um, are not immediately profitable, um, but may well be one day, and other locations that can or are likely to be profitable a bit earlier. To plan this network, um, it's important, it's crucial to consult all stakeholders, those from the mobility sector, those from the energy sector, cities, consumers, and so on. And of course, to align um, the planning of this network to the common vision that I've suggested to spell out in one way, but you could in other ways, um, to be fully interoperable across borders. And this essential network uh, could be 
um, that's co-financed publicly and privately, like it is in essence the case um, for uh, for much infrastructure, charging infrastructure that, that we're seeing today. Um, and it would really have two advantages. It would help infrastructure developers, so the private sector, to build um, what is essential to, to start up the commercial market. But it's also helping the, the public side as a planning tool that, um, that helps allocating grant schemes or subsidies uh, for infrastructure in an optimal way. Um, and these advantages are, are linked to the way uh, the essential network would be defined because it would be defined, um, defi or it would define, it would generate optimal locations for charging points based on the charging demand, so where drivers would charge, but also, and equally importantly, where grid capacity is already available today, which means where the power grid is already sufficiently equipped um, and can be used um, without additional investments. And um, we're insisting on this point because um, we have, we're seeing more and more evidence that uh, connecting and um, to, the, to the power grid and getting the electricity delivered is implying huge cost, and especially for fast chargers, and I'll get to that in a second. So there, um, there are several planning and financing options. Um, uh, rolling out this, uh, uh, what you could call a central network, could go through public tenders with, again, mixed zones, so potentially profitable and um, remote, but one day profitable locations, um, uh, in a sense, run across subsidization model. And I uh, do uh, believe that this is, this is done in some uh, European member states. Um, you could also use um, a proven market instrument um, that we use a lot in the renewable energy sector um, to determine the exact economic value of a charging site, which is auctioning charging point locations. But in any way, um, what has to be done is um, a great integrated planning process. And that means combining the charging needs with the hosting capacity of the grid. Um, next slide, please. To get to these optimal spots. Um, and I just quickly want to show you how this could look like in practice. Um, this is an example for um, a map um, from the um, Open Power Networks project in the UK, um, where you can basically click on any location um, in the map you see here um, and uh, identify um, the hosting capacity of uh, the, the substations in the area. Um, you can see that example orange spot in the top of the map, which will give you a little menu describing um, at which substation you could connect a 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt or 150 kilowatt charger. And um, as you can see in the third um, location, um, or where you could just connect 50 kilowatt and would have to um, pay for upgrades to connect a higher um, capacity charger. Just gives you an example that this is already possible um, with the data we have today that you simply need to, uh, to overlay to get to this grid integrated plan. I'm not going into further details, but I want to underline the importance of taking into account grid capacity when planning charging infrastructure to, uh, to get to the least um, cost um, options. And of course, I'm also putting these concepts on the table because uh, we're working on uh, in the EU on the revision of a number of files, uh, the 10E um, comes to mind, but also in the AFRI review itself, we're seeking to develop the optimal criteria for density coverage of charging points. And, and this is an important criteria to, to, to keep in mind. So our message is in sum, don't plan or mandate charging points without considering and studying existing grid capacity. And at best, take it into account from the start. Um, next slide, please. But I wanted also to uh, use some time to spend on other key aspects of uh, building the charging infrastructure uh, or the charging market that links to the AFI and that, that uh, would require um, clarification as we are uh, reviewing it. Um, and one is the role of grid operators. Um, Kai has mentioned it and he has also made the link to the electricity market reforms. Um, the, uh, the building of the charging infrastructure and its market um, uh, are meant to be um, a commercial development, a commercial market. Um, 
And um, we, uh, we have seen in the past that the early infrastructure um, in many member states has been uh, developed with strong involvement of uh, the grid operators. Um, uh, in the in the recent study we've published on on charging infrastructure, you find you find detail um, um, of a few country examples. Um, there's evidence from um, Spain, uh, Poland, Luxembourg, and and Portugal, but um, in other countries as well, grid operators play a role that uh, have been playing a role that goes beyond um, those of facilitating um, EV grid integration through infrastructure to that of um, uh, building, uh, managing, or even operating charging infrastructure. And uh, you can see those different roles um, in the description of the graph here. Um, now, Article 33 of the Electricity Market uh, Directive uh, clarifies that uh, grid operators should not play this role unless uh, there is no private interest. And, um, and this is certainly formulated in exception to the rule kind of principle. But what we do see happen in practice is that um, where the market hasn't reached a certain point of development yet, um, national governments and, and planners often recur to involving the grid operator quite strongly. So the question is, um, and where I think the, um, the discussions around the AFI directive uh, can and should help, is how can we guarantee um, monitoring this provision? How can we phase in, perhaps, um, uh, sooner rather than later, the operation of a charging point by a private operator, if this is not the case. And another more general point um, linked to the role of operators is that the kind of grid planning I've illustrated that is, that is crucial to get to a least cost, optimal, sufficient, uh, essential charging network, um, uh, requires detailed knowledge of what's happening on our power grids. Um, um, and that's relevant for uh, the companies, but that's also relevant for the regulators. Um, it's relevant for a lot of stakeholders. And we are clearly not yet there in all of um, places in Europe where we can have access to, to this data. Um, so that's, that's another point of transparency that needs uh, development. Um, next slide, please. A related problem um, that could be interesting for, um, for our group today is that um, fixed costs, um, uh, fixed grid costs are becoming an important barrier for, uh, for operators of charging points um, and for fast charging point operators in particular. And I'd of course be really interested to discuss this in, in, the, um, in the discussion with, uh, with those present here. Um, I'm referring particularly to the network costs, that is the cost of delivery of electricity to the charging point. Um, and this relates to the way these costs are structured in many European countries um, and with the growing trend, um, these costs are based on the maximum peak capacity that the charging point can deliver in a given period, so, uh, say a year. Um, and that is independent or almost independent of how many EVs actually charge at that charging point. So. Um, imagine a fast charging point operator opens a new location um, in an area that they they steam um, that they see to become profitable um, in the coming months, but there's still low uh, frequentation uh, for the time being. Um, they would still pay um, several thousands of uh, of euros just for having the electricity delivered. Um, now this is making the business case very difficult, um, and um, I'm not going to go into details, but from the evidence we have, um, we're speaking about um, several thousands of Europe in, um, in different countries. I have um, uh, cases from Slovakia, from Germany, uh, Poland and Spain, um, more details in, in our study. Um, but, uh, and I just want to hint to the fact that this problem is likely to get bigger when we envisage build out of heavy duty uh, charging infrastructure as higher power levels are involved. So it's crucial to also uh, keep in mind um, designing or redesigning these tariffs in a way um, that are more cost reflective, that are more time varying, um, and that can help um, uh, also fast charge operators. There's a, there's a best practice in, uh, or a promising practice in California being tested at the moment. Um, charging point operators are given an exemption um, from um, paying the network tariffs for the first five years of their operation. And they're 
they're paying them back from year six, which means they're basically um, still paying um, the cost, these regulated costs, but they're uh, being allowed a phase in to scale up their operation. Next slide, please. And one more crucial aspect, if I have time, um, I want to mention here um, from a from a grid um, grid integration perspective are the prices at the charging point. This time I'm speaking about the end uh, consumer prices. Um, and here's certainly where the um, alternative fuels infrastructure uh, directive revision can um, can help um, more directly. Um, where um, and we've heard that in previous pre uh, presentations, we're still seeing um, uh, a main lack of transparency and comparability uh, between prices um, for for end consumers. And while um, I think it is clear that prices cannot be entirely regulated as electricity prices are, um, because we're speaking about the private market and building infrastructure, and we want to develop this as a private market, I think it's also fair. Um, to ask for um, for guidelines that uh, ensure consumer transparency um, and make it easier for consumers to compare these prices, and a fair what we consider a fair basis um, to make prices more comparable is um, to base pricing on consumption, uh, on mainly on electricity consumption measured in kilowatt hours, to make them as cost reflective as possible. Um, which means um, that the biggest component of the price uh, should be um, reflecting electricity consumption. And we can discuss about other time, other um, smaller price elements, such as time-based fees in very dense um, areas where it's important to liberate the parking spot. Um, and that's a, that's a um, that's an argument I can I can see um, why it's valid. But why is it so important from a, um, a grid perspective to base um, prices on, um, on electricity consumption, it is because you, uh, you basically allow um, price signals coming from the grid about whether there is uh, space uh, capacity on the network, whether um, there may be lots of renewable energy available and thus the energy prices go down. Um, these uh, price signals that we would like to see in a, in a more dynamic um, uh, electricity market um, should be able to arrive at the charging point at the at the um, operator, who then can decide how they factor them in into their pricing model. Um, so this is really where the pricing um, plays a, a, a huge role in connecting um, a, a modern um, uh, electricity grid with um, with smart EV charging. Um, another part of this also is. Um, uh, to keep roaming prices proportionate, and again, we've uh, we've thought um, about the wording of this. Uh, um, it is about um, giving under uh, consumers the understanding or the um, the ability to see what they're paying for if they're paying for an additional service. I think we can also lean um, on the experience we've gathered in the mobile phone industry, where after 15 years of roaming, we've come to the conclusion that. Um, uh, we can abolish it. Um, yes, there's, there's certainly um, a reason in expanding um, networks through um, grouping through bilateral agreements. However, consumers need to see um, uh, what they're paying for and they need to be able to compare it. Um, I'm sure there's, uh, there's lots of ground for discussion. I just want to conclude with my last slide on the um, policy recommendations we would have on some of these aspects. Um, to conclude, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive Review offers a great opportunity to, um, to develop a common vision for uh, Europe's future charging infrastructure that is interoperable and optimal. Um, uh, one way to do that um, is, to recommend, uh, is, to re is to require member states to define essential charging networks with the objective to provide uh, minimum coverage for uh, of charging points, including hard to serve areas, uh, in view of developing a more competitive market. And to develop a more competitive market, we need to monitor and review the role of grid operators in the field. Um, we need to think about the redesigning uh, fixed cost network tariffs um, that currently represent an obstacle for fast charging operators. Um, and we should also offer guidance for transport pricing 
um, based on consumption. And I'll conclude here. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Julia. Uh, I'm really impressed by uh, the relevance and the level of details uh, in your presentation. All your points about essential infrastructure, the grid integration, the pricing, I mean, they all clearly demonstrate your long experience in the, I remember in the previous AFI and all the points, I mean, that still need to be addressed. So they are, you know, it's spot mm -hmm. on. Thank you so much. And uh, Thank you. we're running a little bit late, but we'll take time for a second poll, uh, which is actually uh, relating to uh, the number uh, the, or the way charging points uh, are being deployed. Uh, I don't know if we can show the, the question of the uh, second poll, quick poll. Uh, should the AFID reg regulate the number of EV charging points in each member state? And you have 30 seconds. Please uh, enter your uh, answers in in the box on your on your screen. And uh, after that, we'll move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Lucien, which will give us uh, an overview of uh, truck um, charging. Ah, interesting. All right. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll discuss that during our panel, but it's almost 50 50, uh, a little bit more for not regulating. All right. So, market wins. With that, uh, our next speaker is uh, Lucien Mathieu from uh, TNE. And uh, Lucien, the floor is yours. We're running, uh, yeah, I would say, 10 minutes late. So, um, just a, a heads up for Arne, who's next. But take your time. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. And thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, and good morning, everybody. So this morning, I will uh, talk about electric truck charging, our analysis of how many chargers we need in the next decade and how the AFID can help bridge this, uh, this gap. Uh, next slide, please. So first, a quick word on TNE. So TNE is a federation of green NGOs working on sustainable transport policies. We are located in about 26 countries with uh, about 60 members and now have uh, six, not five, uh, national offices. Uh, as it was pointed out by Olivier, today we're celebrating our 30-year anniversary with a high-level event starting today at 5 p.m. with speakers like uh, Vice President Commissioner Franz Timmermans and uh, Vice President, Spanish Vice President and uh, Minister of Ecological Transition. Teresa Ribera. So uh, please tune in. It should be a, a good moment. Um, now, before I dive into truck charging, just to say that we have also published a report on electric car charging. So that was published in uh, January, uh, which assesses the, the, the needs for charging infrastructure for cars. But today I will focus on trucks. We've published, uh, following that in February, a roadmap on, uh, with our vision and strategy for electric truck charging. And uh, finally, uh, another report in July, which actually quantifies and assesses uh, uh, this, this vision in terms of uh, numbers of how many chargers we need. So this is really what I will go into uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. But before I do that, just a very quick slide on uh, the, the, the climate impact of different truck technologies. So here we have a life cycle analysis comparison of greenhouse gas emissions for different powertrains. What we see is that the battery electric vehicle, so the battery electric truck in this situation, uh, is the most uh, is the cleanest option today. About uh, it emits about two times less CO2 as a diesel equivalent, uh, and this is so on the life cycle analysis. It includes the production of the battery and uh, the end of life recycling of the battery, etc. And in 2030, uh, electric trucks will emit about uh, three times less uh, CO2 than their diesel equivalent. Uh, so this uh, data that we present here is from a study from uh, the European Commission DG Klima with uh, the consultants Ricardo uh, Energy and Environment, and it was published uh, just this summer in July. 
Now, uh, next slide, we can uh, start diving into the truck charging infrastructure. Uh, so first, TNE came up with uh, our master plan for charging uh, electric trucks in, in February. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we see how that master plan uh, uh, is actually uh, translated in terms of location. So trucks have actually different location, different charging types. First of all, we see uh, there's the depot charging. So this is charging uh, overnight at the depot, um, quite simply like a car charges overnight at home. Um, then we have the, what is usually called the destination charging. This is charging at the distribution hub or at the logistic center uh, while the truck is loading or unloading cargo. And finally, we have the public charging. This can be public charging hubs at uh, urban environments or it can be uh, public charging uh, along the highways, which can be uh, either static or dynamic charging. Um, so in terms of timeline, uh, what is important to note, and this is the, the, the arrow on the left hand side, is that we see clearly that first this will start with the urban and regional deliveries uh, and then move to the long haul. So I will not go in the in, in the details of, of, of that. Um, and we can move to the next slide, which actually explains why this focus first on urban and regional deliveries. Um, so today uh, we see that half of distance covered by trucks in the EU is covered by uh, over trips of less than 300 kilometers. And this is very interesting because uh, this is actually where the market is currently going. We see that already most uh, or if not all of the main truck OEMs are offering trucks, electric trucks with about 200 or 300 kilometer range. Uh, so we have a rapidly maturing market uh, with serious production, which are starting uh, this year or uh, last year and the next one. Uh, thirdly, also the favorable economics. There's, uh, uh, according to McKinsey, the TCO parity, so the total cost of ownership parity between electric truck and a diesel truck will be hit in the early 2020s. Uh, this parity point would be hit, uh, uh, still according to McKinsey, in the second half of the 2020s uh, for the long haul trucks. Uh, then for the urban and regional deliveries, these applications are centered around the urban areas, which means that the charging applications also uh, are uh, in a way much uh, simpler. Uh, uh, and there's quite a reasonable level of public charging actually. When we look at the split uh, of the current charging in terms of the energy delivered for these type of applications, we see that about 80% of the energy is actually delivered overnight at the depot. Uh, then 15% uh, destination charging. So again, this is charging at the distribution hub, uh, the warehouse, the logistics center, while you load and unload the cargo. And finally, 5% uh, public charging. So this 5% public charging can make, let's say, an equivalent with uh, uh, the fast charging for electric cars. So it's used when you have uh, an exceptionally long trip uh, that you need to top up. Uh, so these type of applications, which are usually not uh, recurrent, but still, very necessary to unlock that application. So what we, in, in, in to summarize a bit here, what we really see is that for these uh, urban and regional deliveries, there's a real urgency to come up with a, a master plan to provide a charging infrastructure. And there's quite a good certainty that the battery electric trucks will be the technology to decarbonize these type of applications. And again, this is really what we look at uh, in, in, uh, in our report and in this presentation. It doesn't mean that we don't need to plan as of today the infrastructure for the long haul applications. Uh, of course, the AFID also needs to, to, to address that. Now, uh, next slide, please. Um, so based on this, we modeled three different uh, electric truck uptake scenarios. Uh, the first scenario that we call industry based on is, is based on the ASEA position uh, of uh, 20,000 electric trucks uh, on the road in 2025 and about 200,000 in 2030. Uh, so this is the, the, the gray line on the graph uh, on the right. Then uh, two other scenarios, first one being the EV leader scenario, which is based on about 5% electric, electric truck sales in 2025 and 20% in 2030. And finally, the road to zero scenario, which is our climate compliance, the scenario which is compliant with the EU's ambition for climate neutrality by mid-century. Uh, which targets 10% electric truck sales in 2025 
and 30% in 2030. We see that in this scenario, the number of electric trucks on the road in 2030 surpasses uh, uh, half a million. Um, next slide, please. Now, following this, I'd like to present some of the uh, present the results. So this is a, a slide which actually summarizes the results for our three scenarios. Uh, but first, a, a little word on the methodology. Uh, our analysis is based on a, on a database of uh, truck flows in the EU. So we have the origin, the destination of the trips, and how many of those trips uh, were made during that year. Uh, this database was uh, uh, acquired uh, with uh, and was used by a project, a DG Move research project. And then based on this data, we what we did is that we assessed, we quantified, and we also uh, located uh, the needs uh, for charging infrastructure uh, that we have in the next 10 years for the urban and regional deliveries. Um, so first, the industry baseline scenario. In this scenario, which is equivalent to about 15% electric truck sales in 2030, we calculate that we, we need in 2030 about 10,000 destination chargers and 5,000 public chargers. And in total, this amounts for uh, a CO2 saving of about 8% in 2030. Uh, so this is over uh, truck uh, emissions in the EU. Next, for our two next scenarios, what we did is that we uh, have uh, taken an approach where we uh, prioritize deployment of charging infrastructure at the EU uh, hotspots for freight activity. So these are the little blue dots that you see uh, on the map, uh, on, on the maps uh, here. The reason that we focus on these hotspots is uh, threefold. Uh, first of all, we have uh, a good concentration of the uh, truck activity uh, going to or leaving from this, uh, these hotspots that we also call urban nodes. Uh, we About half of the truck activity in the EU comes or leaves from these urban nodes. Uh, secondly, we have a lot of uh, shorter trips because these urban nodes are typically the, the big cities in the EU. Uh, and have a lot of urban delivery trips. So these trips, which are shorter, are also much easier, uh, can easily be electrified uh, in terms of technology and also costs. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, these uh, cities are also the ones that usually suffer the most from uh, air pollution. Now, uh, if we look at the results from our modeling, let's maybe focus here on, on the road to zero scenario, where about it's, uh, Again, it's equivalent to 30% electric truck sale in 2030. We modeled that we would need in 2030 about, uh, let's say, close to 30,000 destination chargers and uh, about 15,000 public chargers. Uh, this uh, strategy would amount to a total of 22% CO2 reduction. Uh, so these numbers uh, are, are reasonable uh, in terms of deployment over the next 10 years. And also, it, it is this uh, strategy focusing on the hotspots, these urban nodes, is uh, a low investment, high reward uh, strategy. Um, next slide, please. Now I have uh, two slides on our policy recommendations for the revision of the AFID. Uh, so first of all, we recommend that the, the AFID should be turned into a zero emission infrastructure regulation, also called ZIR. Uh, so by doing so, you would focus on only on uh, electricity and hydrogen. So importantly, uh, import, uh, electricity, let's say for cars, it should be electricity only, whereas hydrogen uh, has uh, could have some applications for uh, trucks, for the heavy duty sector, uh, and definitely has uh, uh, is uh, needed for the decarbonization of the maritime sector. So the the definition of what actually uh, um, let's say qualifies as an alternative fuel uh, in the revision of the AFID here is of paramount uh, importance because this uh, would uh, basically show what fuel the EU believes is uh, compatible with its Green Deal strategy with the ambition to reach climate neutrality by uh, 2030. And uh, uh, again, uh, natural gas will not be uh, 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 possible to, 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 to use to decarbonize the, the, the road freight sector. 
as it has very limited benefits in terms of CO2 and as well uh, also for air quality. Uh, uh, so just also to remind that the revision of the AFID was announced as part of the, of the Green Deal. Uh, uh, so this is really something very important. And in addition, uh, the, the, the definition of alternative fuels is at the heart of many uh, national and European funding programs. So, for example, we discussed a bit about the, the CEF funding program. Well, in the CEF transport blending course, you, do, you have a link to the definition of alternative fuels from, uh, from the AFID. And we believe it is unacceptable to continue uh, funding uh, deployment of uh, the, the, the fossil fuel industry being a, a natural gas refueling uh, infrastructure. Now, uh, secondly, another important point uh, is that the, 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 the directive should be turned into a, a regulation. This was uh, briefly mentioned already this morning, uh, but we believe this is important for several reasons. First of all, it allows a, a, a rapid implementation. I think uh, a lot of people have already said this this morning, it's important now to go uh, fast. Uh, the electric trucks, they're coming, but we also have electric cars, the market is now at a, at a turning point with the CO2 standards which are kicking in. Uh, this year, we currently see the market for electric cars uh, uh, around 8% and will continue to increase quite sharply uh, uh, also next year. So the, the, the speed of implementation is, is quite important. And with the directive, you need a few more years to translate it into national law. Uh, and uh, this would make any target, uh, let's say, before 2025 uh, probably unfeasible. Secondly, also a regulation is important for, uh, because it allows for a harmonized uh, implementation. Uh, what we've seen is with national policy frameworks, so the actual, the current approach uh, of the directive, is that we have had a, a quite a fragmented market. Uh, to some extent, when that, uh, the current AFID was voted a few years ago, we didn't have uh, a lot of certainty, the same certainty that we have today about the electric car, electric truck uh, markets. Uh, so, uh, the, now the national policy frameworks are not fit for purpose anymore and we need to move towards uh, uh, binding targets at uh, member state levels which are in line with uh, their uh, uh, climate targets. Uh, importantly, this will also bring a, a lot of certainty to, uh, to the market players uh, and uh, I know that CPOs uh, and the industry, people like uh, uh, Allego and uh, Fastnet this morning, um, also want this, this, this certainty in terms of the deployment of the charging infrastructure. But same for consumers, uh, the, the Europeans that want to buy an electric car also want this certainty about the deployment, the future deployment of the charging infrastructure. And now it's really, uh, the time is really right to, to do so. Um, so finally also uh, on the, 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 the shifting to a regulation, this allows uh, to uh, regulate uh, market players, meaning that we can widen the scope of the, of the legislation to cover uh, uh, private players. So in the case of trucks, uh, this is important because it would allow you to allow the regulation to set targets on, um, for destination charging, meaning targets on uh, distribution hubs uh, and logistic centers, these, these big warehouses where uh, cargo is loaded and unloaded, because these applications do not fit in any uh, definition of the current directive. They are uh, located on private premises and uh, operated, but not publicly accessible, uh, although they can be usually, usually accessible uh, or could be accessible to uh, several transport companies, so they can still be shared. So here is really a need to, to, to um, tailor that the definition uh, and to uh, and to set requirements uh, on those uh, medium and large commercial um, uh, distribution centers. In a very similar way, uh, we believe this is also important because it allows to set uh, uh, targets on commercial property for uh, uh, cars. Now uh, I will move to my uh, last slide. Uh, if we can go next to the yeah, next slide, if please. If you could conclude. Uh... <laughs> yeah, quickly, absolutely. we can leave some time for. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so very rapidly, these are. This gives an overview of the the different uh, targets uh, that we recommend. A bit more in detail. So uh, about two, uh, we recommend to have about uh, to have binding targets for public and destination charging at urban nodes, starting with two public charging stations per urban node in 2025. 
also secondly have uh, targets at national level i mentioned this a bit previously and finally uh, also have a sufficiency indicator much like we have today the 10 to 1 ratio for the number of public chargers to electric cars because there's the, the the maturity of the market for electric truck is not as advanced as the one for electric cars uh, a, a similar sufficiency indicator could be useful uh, and here we calculate that we would need one destination charger for every 15 electric truck and one public charger for every 30 electric truck and these two combined account for amount for about one charger for every 10 electric truck so thank you i'm sorry if i what if i went a bit over it's the okay. over the time uh, and i hope i was able to summarize a bit our, our report in this uh, short presentation thank you lucien and i really am you know appreciate your point on putting pressure on the um, deployment of charging infrastructure. Also, interesting um, point about you know difference between destination charging and public charging, which has been brought up actually in one of the question uh, today. So, yeah, this is absolutely um, absolutely critical. So now moving on, our last uh, speaker, Arne uh, Richter. Arne, I will ask you to keep it to if you get 15 minutes so that we have a bit of time just to conclude at the end before we close uh, on time at noon thank you and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today if we can go to the first slide please Yes, just briefly, uh, a snapshot of our, of our company. Uh, right now we have uh, 20,000 charging sockets under management in our network. Most of those uh, stations we own, we are asset owners. We also have 1,200 fast charging uh, stations under management. So we're both an AC and DC player, meaning normal, regular charging and fast charging in our network. We're active uh, in 12 EU countries at the moment, uh, and we have offices in six uh, and we've been privately held since 2018 by an infrastructure management fund. But we come out of a Dutch uh, DSO, grid operator. Uh, so we're very aware of the grid aspect, which Julia referred to as well. Uh, and we serve over 600 clients, many of whom are municipalities. We are really a pure player CPO. Uh, and we are actually quite good, I think, uh, in providing public charging. Uh, wherever that is wherever that is needed okay next slide please so what we do as a company we basically take any client of ours through the motions in terms of uh, setting up a conversation about what would work uh, in their respective area and on that location it's very geographical driven business so providing charging infrastructure uh, real estate intense so we can go for different uh, setups. So we provide financial services. As I said, we can actually uh, finance uh, the infrastructure that we put in place. We help with the design and realization. Uh, we, of course, as a CPO, maintain and service it, which on the public side, that's 24 seven with a service desk. And we all operate and develop our own EV cloud, allowing for yeah, the fluid, flexible setup of the infrastructure under the conditions that best works at that location or for that particular client. Next slide, please. So this is in brief, uh, just an overview of the hardware. If we can click that, it's, I think it's a dynamic slide and you see the hardware come up. It's, uh, we have AC home chargers in our portfolio. We have street side chargers in our portfolio. If this is not showing that it should be on the slide. We have fast chargers, including 350 kilowatt of fast chargers uh, that we provide uh, also in our Mega E project, but I'll turn to uh, in a minute. Next slide, please. Ah, there's the hardware. If you click through that. Next slide. Yes. So important in our approach to the market because we are a strong believer in making this an open market uh, is that it is 100 percent interoperable using open protocols and standards that we are heavily involved in in terms of the development on those standards that's occp and ocpi uh, both in the past uh, and in the future we accommodate uh, all uh, brands and types of cars so we want to make sure we're able to charge all makes and models which is not an easy thing to do. So you, that allows for a lot of catering of different needs and specifications, especially on the interface of different vehicles on your infrastructure. 
we service white label, so we also provide infrastructure, and Berlin is such an example where we're a CPO, but we're doing that for uh, the, the city of Berlin, so our name is known. Very difficult to find on the chargers, it's almost not there. We also do it for Shell, we do it for Leaseplan, we basically make sure we position other companies to op own and operate infrastructure if, uh, if they are uh, uh, keen to do so. Um, and we also deeply care about and open uh, to all energy suppliers. So the freedom of choice of energy suppliers, a functionality we like uh, incorporating uh, uh, on our infrastructure. Uh, and we use green electricity, of course, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit in a minute. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I, we've also been a recipient of EU funding uh, in the past uh, with projects like FASTI, uh, Ultra E and currently Mega E, and you can go to the next slide. You can just lay out that project for everyone here. That's a big EU project for us. We're hard at work doing that. But it's basically, in brief, the realization of 322 locations and 1,250 ultra fast chargers and hubs in 20 countries and 39 different multimodal hub settings throughout Europe. That's a lot of work. We're hard at work at that. And we're learning incredibly valuable lessons. That's what all these EU projects have basically done. It's a cross-border element to the business, which, of course, is important because cars do not stop at borders. So you need to make sure you can scale uh, uh, across Europe. And that is, uh, yeah, it's been incredibly important for our company to, to scale. If we can go to the next slide, please. So our approach, we work... Uh, collaborative and with different models and with different governments. If we go to the next slide. So this is the slide we developed a while back uh, for EPIC, which is a knowledge center of the European Investment Bank uh, running public-private uh, public partnerships with governments in terms of what works in the EV charging uh, business. Now this, mind you, is mostly for public charging, providing public charging. Just a bit of language about the EV market as such. It is true that public charging is only a slice of the EV charging business. Most of the EV market, of course, sits on AC or normal regular charging, about 80% of that market. And on the public side uh, of all of it, uh, around in the Netherlands at least, it's about between 20 and 25% is related to public charging. Now that differs greatly across the EU. It depends very much on geography. Uh, so the needs of public charging can differ in different member states. So it's always important to incorporate that aspect uh, in your planning as a member state, as a region, as municipalities, in terms of what are your needs. You can basically look at the uh, the market in different phases, a starting phase, a taking off phase, a ramp up market and towards a, a mass market of source, a source and what works. A lot of lessons on the public charging side have been learned already. So if you're in the business as a municipality of realizing public charging infrastructure, it'd be uh, well advised to, uh, to basically to interface with other municipalities across Europe to see what they've done in the past and what has worked and how it has worked. It's an open market model. That's, we are a strong proponent of that. And we carry a lot of the investment risk. And that is possible depending on the type of uh, parameters you set as a municipality in terms of uh, uh, you know, organizing uh, that infrastructure. So setting up clear uh, concession timelines in terms of is it a 10-year or 15-year contract? Is it with a fixed price or is the price adaptable? Uh, what kind of KPIs are you keen to implement in terms of the uptime, uh, but also the smart steering of that infrastructure, so letting it grow through time, making it demand-driven. There are a lot of uh, formulas there, setups there, that have been done and are being done going forward with, uh, well, basically we do quality control. Uh, the Mega E project is also listed here. We think it's a taking off phase market project, so basically, uh, so one of the recommendations we would have for the public charging market is to dedicate public funds, whether it's EU or national or regional funding, to where the market is not really uh, able to do it itself. So they might have market failing, or at least are, the risks are too high, or the, the investment uh, uh, just isn't there out of the market. So therefore, the, the public authorities might need to step in, but still... Keep an eye on the ball to make sure you're not over-subsidizing, you're not over-building, but you always 
are uh, become critical as well to any party doing it for you that KPIs are adhered to. And KPIs that are really important to making the EV charging business a good one is making sure charges are interoperable, uh, there's good information uh, to EV drivers and what the prices are on, on that pieces of infrastructure. Um, yeah, and, and, and basically uh, ensuring a basic level of coverage uh, to make sure you, uh, you can address charging needs uh, in all areas of Europe. So that's gonna be an important one going forward. If we go to the next slide, please. This is our demand-driven model. This is basically one we've implemented in the Netherlands from the outset. If we go to the next slide, it sort of lays it out visually. Apologies for the Dutch. This can be translated. I just couldn't find the English translation in my system, but it must be somewhere. Uh, but basically, uh, for those of you who are uh, able to read Dutch or you might, out of a German perspective, might be able to read it as well, but basically, uh, it is a license model, so the, uh, the municipality basically uh, sort of ensures the, the permit is in place or where the station would be installed and, in, and ensures a parking bay is made available, one or two, depending, of course, on the hardware that is, uh, that is made available. This is about street side charging infrastructure and also how this, the signage is done. And basically, that's what the municipality would be doing. Everything else in terms of the whole process requesting a charging station in the area we've basically taken care of uh, so it comes into a portal we get a request from a particular resident in the municipality we go to the local authority and uh, allude them to the fact that they have a resident in their area who wants a public charging station in a particular zone we then decide with the municipality where that could be best located uh, and then that it's granted, and then we go for the uh, grid hookup and basically realize uh, and invest in that piece of hardware uh, and make sure it, uh, it operates. And we've done that across the Netherlands. We've also done it in Belgium. Uh, we're going to do it in the UK, announcement to come soon. And we're, of course, we're active in Germany as well and in France on the public charging infrastructure side. Um, it's an open market model. That's extremely important, uh, important to stress. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and then we're nearly wrapping up with some recommendations going forward. Um, it's really important also for uh, the AFID uh, discussions that are going to uh, and, ha and have been ongoing in Brussels is that uh, we look at the specificities of the EV infrastructure business as a whole, not just the public charging dimension, which we're thoroughly familiar with, but also with uh, home office charging, fast charging along major corridors, which we're familiar with as well, and to develop uh, catered plans per member state, uh, ideally, on what uh, needs to be done uh, to ensure the appropriate amount of coverage is ensured. So if there's EU funding available, uh, a basic level of coverage would be, would be important, but also to look at those areas in the EV charging market that might or need uh, support. I'm particularly thinking of multi-home dwellings, uh, uh, basic apartment buildings in inner city areas, underground parkings, uh, having funding schemes in place that help with the cabling and pre-ducting uh, of those parking garages under multi-home dwellings, uh, that might be a very sensible thing to do to ensure that not the first, or the, the first resident in that building has to pick up all of the bill. I don't think that would be fair, but to socialize some of those costs. Otherwise, that sector of home charging and underground parkings in many places in Europe will be very difficult to get, uh, to get off the ground. And there are other more specific areas. And fast charging, for example, in the larger EU countries, uh, maybe not very close to major grid uh, uh, connections, might also deserve uh, support otherwise uh, yeah ensuring that basic level of coverage for fast charging along major routes in big eu countries uh, might just not come off the ground so that's also important to uh, to factor in um yeah but uh, any eu funding going forward at least uh heavy on kpis making sure that uh, the consumer needs are addressed there as well uh, and uh, the big pitfall usually is is when you are rolling out EV charging infrastructure across Europe is that it's, the money goes to hardware of a particular type and then people don't think about the needs of actually serving it, maintaining it and making it operable through time. Uh, so it'd be a mistake, uh, I think, uh, to just focus in on that hardware component. Uh, the big 
benefit of uh, electric vehicles are, of course, electricity is everywhere. It's just a question of tapping into it uh, in a professional manner. Okay, let me leave it there. Thank you, Arne. Super clear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, congratulations on Mega E. And uh, I like your statement about the uh, open market. And uh, certainly the demand driven uh, approach, which was initiated by the city of Amsterdam, I remember many years ago. Raise your hand, <laughs> get a charging <laughs> point. <laughs> that was brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Um, yeah. So let's see if we can keep uh, now 10 minutes for uh, going around on a sort of a short panel discussion um, and uh, see if we can take uh, one or two questions. Um, so can we have everybody on the screen now? And um, thank you, first of all, all of you for very clear presentation, very insightful, so informative and uh, spot on in, in many aspects of the of the topic. And um, one of the, you know, while you're all here, one of the question, I, you know, which was discussed and raised uh, during the, 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 the conversation and the presentation is this topic of uh, um, regulation versus market driven. And, um, and the, the, the question I'd like to, to ask to the group um, is, uh, is whether, um, in your view, um, uh, the number of charging points, and by that I mean public charging point, um, should be regulated or, and left to the member states, um, uh, or um, left to the to the market, and uh, with the view that uh, probably the, taking reference to the previous AFI could be useful, and um, you know, in terms of order just to give a, a, um, a, a, a little bit of organization maybe we could go in reverse order uh, starting with Arne and going uh, Lucien, Julia, Ranske and, and, and Kai um, so yeah regulation or market driven I, I guess I, I I have your answer Arne well, I might surprise you there. I think ah, on, ah. on Ofid, I think uh, we would welcome a regulation, very much so. But on specifically on uh, the requirements on basic level of coverage on public charging, I, that's an interesting one. I, I would have to think about that. Uh, of course, we would. If this is a rational business. It's. Uh, I would definitely be an advocate for an open market model. But also, uh, this one in 10 ratio that, that we had in the past served as well. I mean, uh, but I think we've moved on from that now. It's a very different place we are today in terms of the market outlook than it was back in 2014. I think we can now sort of incorporate some of those learnings and look more at the functionalities of the public charging. Uh, uh, also look at power levels, uh, basically. I mean, what is public charging? Is that a 3.7 kilowatt charger these days, or is it 11 kilowatts? I think we could put some requirements in place, and then it's about power dispensing capacity of your network. Is that the, going to be the metric, or is it going to be the metric of the amount of charging stations that you have in your vicinity? I think that's a conversation we should have between between all parties, member states, uh, the EU uh, Commission, and, and stakeholders to see what makes sense because public charging just honing in on that and then uh you know uh, laying down a, a number of charging stations that a particular member state should uh, should achieve i don't think that makes a lot of sense i think it uh, it needs mm. it needs smarter metrics yeah lucia any views on that uh, although you were fairly clear <laughs> well no, i think the, the the market decides on on, on a lot of things, but uh, very importantly, the regulation is is needed here to provide the the, the vision uh, and the certainty for uh, for for the markets. Um, so a minimum level of, uh, of of public charging for for each uh, country, we think is is a is a very good idea, and this should be again in line monitored to be make sure it's in line with the market and with climate. But it's also possible to do this, uh, let's say, in, in, in a flexible way in member states. In, in the metrics that we recommended in our previous report on, on the cars, we, uh, we 
have uh, to give member states the, the flexibility to decide you know what type of chargers they want to deploy and uh, by doing so you also give them a certain weighting meaning that a fast charger has more uh, weight counts more if i can say than uh, an ac charger and mm -hmm. an ultra fast charger more than uh, just a 50 kilowatt fast charger uh, and also mm -hmm. to uh, uh, alleviate a bit of the member states addressing uh, you know market players like commercial properties the shops the malls uh, the, the the parking lots the the petrol stations also helps you know uh, member states uh, achieve those targets in in a in a rather flexible way where the market still gets to decide uh, on a lot of uh, places thank you lucien and uh, julia yes thank you so i think we're all looking for um the the policy approach uh, to provide this um uh, minimum uh, sufficient or, or preferably optimal uh, charging network to get the market going. I think that's the consensus here. Um, as for RAP, um, whether this is reached uh, via a regulation or a very strong directive, I think um, you know is not um, uh, our key point. What we want to see is um, a clear improvement um, uh, in contrast to the um, to let's say the commitment that followed the national policy frameworks. If you want, you could see the essential network approach that, that I've tried to, uh, to describe um, as, a, as an, um, uh, an improved um, uh, national policy framework uh, setting because you would, um, you would uh, the new AFI legislation would uh, require member states to define such a network and that let me just be clear is a mandatory requirement but it would also give member states um, the uh, some margin to define what is essential for them because obviously the markets are developed in a different uh, way and it's one of the many criteria that we need to take into account when we think about um, things such as coverage um, and sufficiency um, and by the way, the essential network um, would include different um, power le levels, a different type of chargers. So I'm not only speaking about fast charging here. It's about where these make sense and where capacity is and at which cost you can build it. Um, but what we do want to make sure is that if there is a European um, a methodology, a reference methodology for developing such an essential network uh, in Europe, which I think could make sense. It is um, based on grid integrated planning. It is, it is taking into account um, where the capacity is, where costs can be saved. And it's, it's by doing that, it would optimize um, the, uh, the public part of investments that, uh, that the EU or the member states would, um, would put in there to, to help develop this minimum infrastructure. I think that is for us really the key point. Mm. I see. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Your presentation was all, yeah, clear on that point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Anske, your views? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I think that uh, regulating, let's say, numbers of charge points uh, for members, I think that could be actually very useful, basically, to help the member states uh, setting focus. And then I think that could then be useful for them to also look at sort of underlying policy barriers uh, and lifting those, such as the ones I mentioned in my presentation, which is like really the access to highway service areas. So I think it can really help the member states to focus. Um, but also I want to echo what, what Arne said, which is I think it's important to not only look at numbers, but also at capacity, because there's really a big difference between, uh, for example, a, a slow charger um, of a few kilowatts and a high power charger of 350 kilowatts that you know um, can charge tens to hundreds of cars per day versus uh, just a handful of cars per day. So like the, the volumes, don't look at volumes at capacity, I think is also very important. And also not just, yeah, you can say numbers, but do it also in a smart way. We like really look where is it needed? Where is it less useful? What kind of charging? So really make it a, a smart approach, I think is important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Guy, uh, your, your views and possibly closing remarks because we're getting very close to, to noon now. Well, I think uh, that question is for me more in a listening mode, uh, what stakeholders <laughs> actually expect from us. Uh, but I, I would like to say one thing on the regulation directive uh, discussion. I think we should be very careful uh, 
not overestimating what European regulation can do. Even if, even if we came up with a regulation, uh, it's not the magic bullet which would deliver alternative fuel infrastructure across Europe in a sufficient level. I think one thing that became pretty clear from Arne's presentation in particular is how many players are actually involved, be it the municipalities, the regions, the member states and the EU and all the different market actors uh, to actually deliver on uh, sufficient infrastructure and the uptake of electric vehicles. So there are lots of players and uh, government levels involved and simply one European legislation, be it directive or regulation, uh, will, will simply not be sufficient. It can just set basically the guidance where then the markets can develop. Um, so I think uh, and, and here I agree pretty much with what Julia said. Uh, I think what AFID needs to deliver is to provide a very, very clear framework uh, and certainty and where the market actually develops so that we actually uh, have sufficient infrastructure, minimum infrastructure for the uh, vehicles that will come up to the market. And then let's see at a later stage, which is then the best legislative instrument to actually deliver that. Uh, but I think what is, what is good and what is clear is that I think we have a common understanding of what is actually needed in terms of, uh, well, yeah, sufficient numbers, but also in terms of quality of the infrastructure. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. And, um... I, I need to thank uh, all, all of you for your, your time today, the presentation, the answer to the question. I also um, thank the audience of, uh, I think, close to 100 uh, participants or so, uh, you know, uh, I believe. So I, I hope this, uh, this webinar was informative. And um, I guess we'll see you during the course of, of the year with this uh, successful implementation of the AFI and, uh, and going into 2021. So thank you very much and um, have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.